Well, thank you uh, very much for uh, the opportunity to be here today and to uh, give you a bit of my perspective on uh, science policy uh, from, I would say, from my different roles that have occupied through my career as a, a regulator, as a performer of, of uh, research, and also as a policymaker at the number of levels. Um, I'm also going to relate a bit to my current work at NSERC because I think it has some relevance to the global science policy area, especially at the higher levels of uh, policy. So uh, the, the first thing I, I would like just to uh, show you, this is a, a bit of a, a diagram of the Kenyan federal SNT structure. So the, the Kenyan government uh, performs research and uh, it funds research, and CERC plays a role in funding research. And, and actually, some, sometimes we forget that NSERC funds quite a bit of research in the health side, uh, either on health technologies, and we have collaborative health research program with CIHR, a number of other areas, uh, the Network Center of Excellence, and so on. So we play a role there. Uh, but most importantly, I think, for this discussion today, is that the Kenyan government is a big user of science. And it's a bit of a complicated picture, as you can see. And depending on where you are, if there are decisions taken at the policy level or the economic level. But I'll come back to that in terms of when you look at the different instruments that the government has to implement policies. Um, one thing that is missing there is the, 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 uh, the um, Kenyan Institutes of Health Research are under the, the research funding group, but there's no uh, box for the health minister, but the, that organization uh, reports to the health minister. But also as a link to the Minister of uh, Science, uh, the Minister of State for Science and Technology. So again, another message here, it's a bit of a complex picture again, when you're looking at, at policy and one of the, the bigger issues for the Canadian government is in terms of uh, the development of policy and the implementation of policy is coherence between the various aspects or the various goals of the government and the different levels of government. Just to mention uh, about NSERC, I won't say much, uh, but uh, we have a budget of about a billion dollar. Uh, we are reaching quite a bit uh, of the, the academic world, the, the private uh, sector world. 30 students are supported to uh, the, the, the scholarships, fellowships that we're giving, the, the research funding. There's 12,000 uh, university professors across Canada who are supported. and about 4,000 research projects with close to 2,000 Kenyan companies involved. So again, quite a bit of reach to the uh, research that we're funding, the research and the people that we're funding. So now focusing on the topics for two days, science policy and health, you can look at it in, in uh, different aspects. So the, the first one is about accessing and generating the scientific evidence necessary to support health policy development and commitment. So I'll touch on that, but it's, it's really the second aspect that I'll focus on because of, of my experience uh, in this area. It's anticipating and addressing impacts of emerging science and technologies uh, on health policy, healthcare delivery, and regulation. And again, to relate that back to the role of the of government in general, but the federal government, we have two roles if you want it to put it very simply, and that's for my former ADM at uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food, who uh, essentially was saying government are about making good things happen. So NSERC is more on the making good things happen side, where we fund research and hopefully things will, innovation come through that, or preventing bad things from happening. And if you look at the department like Health, Health Canada, or Canadian Food Inspection Agency, it's very much about, uh, when you look at the regulatory role, about preventing bad things from happening. So. When you look at science and the role of science uh, in, in developing policy or in the implementation of, of policies, it's again a bit of a uh, complex way of, of um, interactions with science. And it's also not a linear process. We try to illustrate it through a linear process, but it, it's very rarely a, a linear um, way of looking at it. I'm just going to use pointer here. So essentially, the scientific risk assessment um, area of uh, the uh, implementation of policy is uh, extremely important. And uh, that uh, uh, is illustrated here. And essentially, you need to have a trigger uh, if you're dealing with a particular issue. Uh, there's something that uh, is detected out there. There's a food uh, 
um, a food issue or um, a drug, a bad reaction of a drug and so on. So there is a trigger and then you have to look essentially at the physical, biological and chemical properties, so the more the, the, the natural uh, art sciences. And you have to look at, in terms of risk elements, the exposure, the fate, susceptibility and hazard, you have to do the assessment, manage the risk, decide uh, and uh, act upon what you find and review and adapt. And all through this, yes, at, at the point of entry, there is a, a strong role for science, and you could look at it from a preventative standpoint or from a reactive standpoint. So, but when you're looking at the, um, the, the decisions, there often it's very difficult. You can't really separate from the, the assessment side and the management of the risks themselves. And again, it's, it's a, a very, um, a complex that is a, a bit at, at times messy because you're often reacting to situations where you have to act rapidly. But then when I think you look also at that in terms of risk management in, in public policy, that's become even more complex because it's when you have an issue to deal with and you're looking at scientific risk assessment, it's, it's a bit more defined. But if you look at public, the development of public policies, you have to look at the um, the identification of the problem, you have to look at the legal consideration, the duty of care, international obligations. Scientific evidence comes into the picture as one of the elements for decision. And often, when you're on the scientific side, it's difficult to understand how a decision at the end has been taken or uh, how a policy has, has been um, developed and implemented given the scientific evidence at uh, the beginning. But What's happening is that there are development of options and costs enter, benefits enter to the uh, equation. The instrument that is being used for the, uh, the uh, implementation of the policy ta is taken into consideration. The precautionary approach uh, is applied. And then there's political advice and input. Cabinet, parliament uh, approvals are required. There's implementation and evaluation and then the effectiveness is being looked and then there are re revisions to policies. So again, a, a bit of a uh, complex approach and you can go back at any points there and restart the process. So that's another, uh, that's a, one of the messages that I'll keep repeating. And the public context is extremely important because you have to look at values and ethics, at policy priorities, at public views of acceptable risk or acceptable ways of uh, dealing with whatever issues that, um, that we have to make decisions on. So when you look at that, the policy development, if you're trying to simplify that, again, that's a, a linear way of uh, pr representing it here, but it's really not that linear. So again, repeating that message. So we have to frame the problem and then look at uh, of, uh, what uh, the evidence is there. There could be scientific risk assessment if it's an issue of, a, of uh, public health, but it could be in terms of facilitating uptake of new technologies in public health sector and so on. And we have to determine how urgent it is. And you have to look at who's responsible, the stakeholders, engage them, and the engagement has to be continuous again. You have to make sure that the roles and responsibilities are clarified, the policy goals and commitments um, are identified clearly, the options, their advantages and disadvantages so that decisions can be taken appropriately, recommendations have to be made based on evidence and then you choose the instrument and the outcomes that will tell you what to do next. And uh, here just uh, an illustration on, on the type of issues that we have to deal with uh, in the healthcare sectors, uh, nanotechnology, uh, the regenerative medicine, functional foods, health informatics, electronic healthcare application, genomic personalized medicine, uh, the whole issue of energies, that just gives you some uh, a, a brief idea of the, the large number of issues that we have to deal with in the health sector. Oh, and there is another one that, uh, in terms of catastrophes, that we have to deal with, and, and uh, often those uh, catastrophic events will uh, provoke some major shift in, in policies. So policy complexity, Another element, and I won't get into much of the details here, but when you look at the product in particular, at the health products, you really have to take an approach that is from cradle to grave. So from the time you extract it, from the time you produce it, to when it is disposed of. 
So again, it, the, the complexity of, uh, of what the, the, and the type of scientific evidence that you have to consider is really um, quite enormous. And there are some, uh, if you think about emerging technologies, if you think nanotechnology or genomic medicine and so on, there are some key policy questions, and that applies more generally also. First, when you're looking at an issue or emerging technologies, you have to, uh, as a policymaker, you have to ask yourself, is it sufficiently different, either in complexity or in magnitude, to warrant uh, revisiting the approach to coordination, governance, and regulation? That's essentially a very basic question that we have to um, ask. And then, if there is a, an impact on the promotion of health, is there a role to facilitate the uptake into uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, healthcare system, but also to ensure the sustainability of the healthcare system? And is it also contributing to global health goals? And I think that's one of the, the big issues now in the health sector that we're dealing with. There's some really exciting new technologies, uh, some new advances in medicine, but because of the costs that, are, that uh, are associated with those new technologies or those new approaches, it poses questions for the sustainability of the healthcare system because there's a finite envelope. Even though you're saying you're saving some money, the money is going to be spent somewhere, so you're not shrinking the, 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 the money that is available for healthcare. So how do you approach that? And then uh, in terms of priorities, do we set priorities for, do we have to set priorities for science and research? for in internal when you think about the government or external research, another big question. So, and again, uh, taking the example yeah. of uh, emerging science and technology, yeah. um, you have to address the scientific evidence base, the skills that are available, the capacity, the legislation, regulation, policy impacts, uh, including ethical, legal, and social perspective, uh, the issues around health system innovation, knowledge transfer, the awareness, internal and external. And all to do this, collaboration is essential. And when you, once you've decided on the policy, you have to look at the, the tools that you have to make sure that the policy is, uh, the goals of the policies are realized. You could take no action. That's an action in itself. Uh, you could look at public, uh, public communication and awareness. You could look at monetary incentives, disincentives. It could be grants. It could acts on regulation, enforcement, uh, it could be voluntary standards and guidelines, or it could be true programs. So I won't go through the details of this uh, particular side, but essentially, uh, when you look at policy, the challenges are related to how best to engage a scientist. How do you go and get the scientific evidence that is uh, required? How do you achieve regulatory or policy cooperation? How do you reduce and address uncertainty? Because if you're dealing with a new issue, a new field, there's always uncertainty. And how do you support consumer choice if you're thinking about, uh, for instance, of biotherapeutics? But it's also how do you support the choice of the public out there if uh, you're taking decisions in the healthcare system? One of the big challenges for us, and uh, that's uh, something that was published in 2010 in The Economist, when you think about policy, when you think about science, is, uh, is the uh, data deluge. It's, uh, the, the number here is essentially um, the, the quantity of information that is being generated now, if you're thinking again, one of the fields that I know best, but in terms of genomics, proteomics, and so on, it's how can we deal with all that information, and how can we make sure that the information is translated to knowledge for uh, policy making. A very, very uh, huge challenge. And uh, just the example here is uh, in 2010, there was uh, 1,200 exabytes of digital data that uh, would have been generated, and that equals to 10 billion copies of The Economist. I don't think that there's any policymaker that can read 10 billion copies of The Economist in a, in a year. So. Very huge issue. So, in conclusion, I didn't touch much on this, but science is global and crosses national borders, which is a challenge uh, when you think about policy making. You cannot just rely on the expertise that we have in Canada. We, Canada generates less than 5% of the scientific production in the world, so we have to be able to access that all of that information. But policymakers around the world face uh, similar challenges that 
emerging technologies or other type of uh, LT issues. Partnership and collaborative models, domestic or international, are essential for policy development and implementation. You have to be adaptable and flexible. Again, I showed those pictures of, of, of in a linear fashion with arrows that were linking them back together. But like, the, because of the complexity, again, of the issues and the amount of information we have to deal with, we have to be flexible. We have to be able to take on new information to change the policies and the, or, uh, or programs uh, to adapt to whatever uh, new evidence we're facing. And when decisions are taken, we require quality and partial advice best on, uh, based on the best available evidence and a rational analysis of that evidence.